back at uh, the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee on Thursday, September 10th, talking about S237. Ellen, if we could um, can pick up where we left off, which was like section, I don't know, are we up to five yet? Um, so in, uh, where we left off was what is section four in the as pass version and, uh, section five in the strike all version. Um, and that was as far as the, um, as past version, the only other section related to the municipal zoning component is the implementation section at the end. So they didn't know where you wanted to go next. Um, well, let's go. Can we be in the can we be in the strike off? Sure. Okay, so in the strike all, so we were, we had been talking about the report from the department on municipal constraints. Um, and so then the next section, section six, <clears throat> was the language regarding um, challenges to uh, bylaws under 4412. Um, so the attorney general can enforce against towns uh, where there's uh, concern that the bylaws are not conforming to 4412 and that they are discriminatory. Um, okay. And this I believe was a VPA, the, the, the desire to have some um, <clears throat> enforceability was a question from the VPA or request to have some kind of language in there. I don't know, Alex, do you recall that? It was, um, but what's been drafted here only, uh, just so you understand, would only apply to a portion of what we're talking about. Uh, it would not apply as it's drafted to the inclusive housing provision, unless, Alan, I'm missing something. No, so I, so what's here in section, section six is the technical correction. So, uh, I think the VPA is sort of raising two, two, I saw two points. So first, we are amending section 4412. And one of the things we're doing is we're adding a subdivision A. And so the technical correction is the first part. And that's what I did. So because we're amending it, I left this section needs to have the new subdivision A to make the cross reference correct. Um, but then there is the second question of if you want the new inclusive development provisions to fall under this, um, this uh, enforcement provision. And so I did just wanna point out that currently it, this um, statute 4453 only applies to 44.12.1. Um, and there are other things in 44.12 to which it does not apply. Um, but I can read you the sort of short list of what it currently applies to. So it currently applies to bylaws um, under, uh, so you can't um, have your bylaws violate your town housing element or have unfair housing practices. Uh, the bylaws can't exclude mobile homes, mobile home parks, prefabricated pre homes or modular homes and you can't exclude mobile home parks with your bylaws. Um, you must allow multi-unit residential dwellings in at least part of your town. Um, it covers the, you must allow at least one accessory dwelling unit. And then it also covers uh, residential care and group homes. So you can't forbid, uh, prohibit those either. So that's the list of things that this provision currently covers. Um, and so those are the things that if the bylaws as written or as administered violates any of those, the, this statute is used to challenge that as discriminatory. 
So you have the option if you think that the in, you would like to then add the inclusive development provisions um, regarding density, um, you can also add that if you want, but it is a policy decision. And, and this is Alex again. I think from VPA standpoint, uh, we weren't sure what the intent was, but from from a planning standpoint, um, the this enforcement provision is all about uh, housing, and the inclusive development provision seeks to be about that as well. So I think we thought it would make sense to give the attorney general the power to challenge um, both uh, what they what the attorney general always has been able to, which is what Ellen just read, as well as the inclusive housing provision. Okay, Representative Walls has a question. Yes, I just want to be clear. Uh, all of those uh, different types of housing that you just listed off, Ellen, is that new to the statute? Or are some of them new? Or I, I just want to be clear on that. No, I read you the list of things that currently exist in 44.12.1 that this section applies to, okay. this currently exists. Okay, thank you. It's also our understanding at VPA that the, the, we're not aware that this provision has ever been invoked, that the attorney general has ever um, made an investigation about whether municipal bylaw um, violated the this, this spirit of um, housing provisions and, and um, discrimination on that front. So it's little used. Okay, Ellen. I did find one case where it was used. It was not an attorney. It was not an attorney general um, investigation. It was um, independently challenged by a developer, I believe. Um, so yeah, but the, the point is true. It's not that often used, but it is a tool available. Earhart, Monka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Earhart Monka for the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. I just want to say we really appreciate um, the uh, planners bringing this to everyone's attention. And as I mentioned briefly yesterday, I, I think since, you know, if you are going to include uh, 2B, um, it makes sense, even if little used, uh, to have this provision in since it all uh, addresses uh, housing. So we, we would support inclusion of um, of B uh, in the uh, in the language, and thanks to Alex and, and Sharon uh, for for bringing this up. Right, Representative Kalaki. Thank you. I I I think too that we should have the inclusionary uh, zoning aspect of this uh, added. Alan, if, I, if I if I'm understanding correctly. Um, you know, that's a major intention of this law. So I think it'd be great if we could integrate it. All right, next section. Can I just interrupt for a second, please, that the next section is also labeled section six on the strike all, is that a typo? Yes, sorry, there's, I found a couple of other typos also. So yes, this is a typo. So section six repeated is the enumeration of powers. It should yes. be section seven, yeah, okay. And so this is um, language at being added to title 24. Um, it's in the municipal power section. So this is, uh, giving municipalities uh, the ability to regulate short-term rentals separately from uh, long-term rental units. And so this is this provision was in the as passed by the Senate version, um, but I just moved it up because it's also part of Title 24. So I thought it made sense just for it to fall under this section also. And it fell later because we, we had attached it to, um, or in a discussion with the potential study. Yes. Right, and that's that's how I got mixed up here with the keeping the study and or moving this up. So um, 
comments about this. This is a uh, may, um, or they shall have the following powers to be able to do this. Yes. Um, this relates to Vermont being a Dillon's rule state where the municipality only has the powers granted to them by the legislature. So here you are granting municipalities the this ability to regulate short term rentals. Okay. Questions on this? Yes. Can you just tell me currently, are there no um, regulations of short term rentals or are there some few? So um, I have heard anecdotal and I don't, I don't know this to be true, but I have heard, uh, so let me just, let me just step back. Um, this provision was drafted by Tucker in my office. Um, we, our office, the position of our office, office is that we did not find an explicit um, grant of authority to do this anywhere in um, Title 24 already. And so it is, the, it is the opinion of our office that this ability to regulate short-term rentals separately from uh, regular uh, long-term rentals is a power that municipalities do not have currently. Um, I have heard anecdotally that there may be some towns that are doing this. Um, and so if that's true, that may be problematic. And so this language uh, is clearly giving towns the ability to do this. Representative Zahn. Yeah, this is sort of getting into the, as I just put the link in the chat, my, uh, I don't know how to characterize them, but my, my neighbors in Woodstock, uh, I won't make disparaging remarks about them, but they are, they are regulating uh, short-term uh, rentals uh, at, you know, or at least think they are, um, as we speak. And I guess, I guess, sort of uh, part of my question about this is, and I, I assume then, obviously, that this this ability to regulate is embedded within all the other statutory infrastructure for regulating uh, housing in its various guises, and therefore, um, it's subject to all of the other. Um, this this by no means. Uh, disallows or allows a municipality to regulate them in a way that wouldn't comport with other statute. I mean, that's pretty obvious. I'm just making sure for the record. I, I, can you yeah. can you repeat the question? Yeah, I just meant um, that obvious. I mean, it's I think I'm asking the obvious, which I don't I try not to do, um, which is by allowing municipalities to do this form of regulation they can regulate it differently than long term, but it still has to comport with all other statutes in terms of housing regulations elsewhere. In other words, you can't, you couldn't establish regulations that didn't comply with other parts of the statute, or particularly, like, say, the provisions in this bill, for instance. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Alex. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, to comment that if the, if the state wants municipalities to be able to regulate short term rentals, this provision is key because my understanding of case law is that uh, the Vermont Supreme Court has held that uh, the term of a rental uh, is immaterial and that the use is the same, regardless of whether it's rented for a weekend, a week, a month, a year. And uh, that's the way we've, that's the way we understand the law to be. And therefore that's how most municipalities, perhaps Woodstock is the exception, um, talk to uh, landowners about uh, short-term rentals. And so we don't, I agree with Ellen, we don't have, municipalities do not have the authority to regulate them differently from any other use, uh, residential use, and this would, this would give municipalities the ability to do so. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a pretty substantial policy change, but it's an important one if we want to get our hands around short-term rentals and how they might be impacting our um, more traditional housing supply.
Earhart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll just, I was going to say the, uh, make the same observation that our uh, representative Zott made. Uh, certainly Woodstock, I know, um, is uh, uh, trying to regulate um, Airbnb and the other platforms. I'll also say that uh, there's been some extensive efforts in Burlington uh, underway to, uh, for Burlington to implement um, uh, regulation of short-term rentals. Uh, Burlington may have its own charter authority. I can't remember exactly uh, what authority they're using to um, um, they, they are using to do that. It hasn't been implemented yet, but I know that um, I, I believe that for clarity's sake, this would certainly be uh, something that uh, we would like to see uh, so that municipalities that didn't want to uh, regulate on their own um, could uh, could do so and had clear statutory authority to uh, to do that. As mentioned yesterday, you know we consider to be we continue to be concerned uh, deeply about the conversion of long term rentals to short term rentals all across the state, and that exacerbating uh, our our housing uh, our housing shortages. Um, so um, we would support inclusion of, of of this for clarity's sake. Thank you. Representative Hanko. Thank you. So in reference to Earhart's comment um, about charter authority, um, so if a municipality is using their charter authority and regulating short-term rentals at this point and, and thinking that they're doing it properly, will this state statute override that, supersede that authority? Uh, I, I don't know, the, um, really how charters work. Um, that's sort of Tucker's realm. So I can get back to you. I don't, um, I don't know. I would appreciate that unless someone else has the answer to that, because I'm not familiar with chartered municipalities since I don't have any in this area and haven't really studied that. Um, but it would, as with everything, <laughs> almost everything, it would seem to me that municipalities would like to regulate their own um, their own municipality and not have the state tell them what they need to be doing beyond, you know, the health and safety, obviously, um, of of people dwelling in those buildings. But that is an opinion. Thank you. I'm not a lawyer, but I would venture um, the opi opinion, excuse me, that the language that you see before you is broad enough so as not to restrict um, whatever individual charter authority uh, a, a municipality might have. Um, Representative Gonzalez. Um, just to... Um... Representative Hango, your kind of question of, um, and I would love to hear back what Tucker's response would be, but since we are a Dillon's rule state, that the um, charters of each of our municipalities that have charters are approved by us as legislators. And so then <laughs> we are able to give authority according to approval of the charter. So if, if somebody, if a municipality's charter says that they have authority, we have the legislature has already approved that. And so that gives them an authority, but that there, there, um, there is a push um, to change us as Dylan's rule so that municipalities don't have to go through us as a state in order to make these changes on the municipal level. So um, just as a, a small little background on that piece, since Representative Hango, you said that you're, you don't have that familiarity, but, but I, I do, so I wanted to share that. Thank you, I appreciate that. And also Earhart's comment, I guess my my underlying question then is, does this statute supersede anything that the, the municipality would have in their charter at the time of this passage? No, this is enabling legislation. This allows them to do it. It doesn't say that they shall. It's, they shall have the following power to do it, but not they're, they don't, they're, it's their choice whether they, whether they enable this kind of legislation on a local basis. And what we just heard is that we don't, they don't explicitly have that right to do that. Whereas chartered, some chartered municipalities can. So again, this is expanding, uh, and uh, this is expanding a power to the towns that they do not currently have. 
Um, I've been reminded by our administrative assistant that the chat box is not available to the public. And so um, we just have to be very, um, we need to refrain from chatting policy in the box. Um, I think the clarifications that have been posted, of course, have been um, discussed after we've seen them um, for today, but just as a reminder that um, in order to remain transparent, we need to we need not to discuss policy um, during in the chat box during our session. So, just thank you, Mike, for for bringing that back up. Um, all right. So, any further questions on this section? Seeing none, um, Ellen, if you could scroll down. <clears throat> Okay, so what's um, the so that's I think the conclusion of our municipal zoning um, sections. Uh, then we get into the tax credit language. So uh, section seven that starts at the bottom of page thirteen and goes into page fourteen is the technical correction for the tax credit language in the village center statute. So it's just condensing all that into a single reference. And then section eight is, uh, so we're in the downtown and village center uh, tax credit program in title 32. And this section adds um, neighborhood development areas as an area where projects can apply for the tax credit. And we're adding a new type of project eligible for the tax credit, which is the flood mitigation um, project. So there are two, two new additions to this tax credit program. And you did hear some testimony this morning from the commissioner about adjusting the language um, on line 16 to um, instead to refer to the area mapped as a river corridor as, as opposed to referring to the rule. Um. And if Chris, is Chris still here? Yep. Um, that change makes a lot of sense to me. Chris Cochran from the department. Our intent was, you know, these are these are narrow geographies and we wanted the public to be able to see who qualified and who did not. And if DEC believes this is a simpler and clearer approach, that makes a lot of sense to us. Thanks. Okay, further questions on this? Again, yeah, we did discuss it earlier today. So okay, section so nine. section nine also re relates to this. It's the um, the actual tax credit language. Um, and then we get into the mobile home park sections. So uh, this morning, again, you had testimony from the commissioner of DEC making recommendations on this language. This section 10 is related to the town of Brattleboro and the Tri Park Co Cooperative. Um, and I did uh, note this morning that you discussed the commissioner's recommendations and I think you decided to adopt his recommendations on this section. Um, or we, well, I think if we have the recommendations at this might have been this might have been discussed a little bit while you had to duck out. Oh, okay. Um, so on line six, mm -hmm. where it says um, tactical basin plan comma including through restructuring and forgiveness. And then on line eight. Um, Drinking water. Yes, committee, do we have a, a representative Dolan asked us to think about it again. So um, 
do we have further thoughts about it? I think, um, you know, I think the concern that Representative Dolan was talking about was uh, pretty global and larger policy, which I think the commissioner um, acknowledged and appreciated and, um, and but that he still seemed to want to see language that in terms of this particular project um, that in this particular narrow thing that, that drinking water be in, uh, included in this. Any thoughts on that? And if I didn't represent that you know, correctly, please correct me. Can you reiterate, please, what her actual concern was about adding that? Um, if I'm, again, if I'm misrepresenting her, um, someone please correct me, but I believe what I heard her say was that in general, when we seek to help communities like this, we, they understand that drinking water is part of it, but that we as a state can't promise maybe, or can't anticipate, um, that, that, every, that it should be the state policy, the state policy that, um, that drinking water be included in, in that phrase. Did I represent, you know, did I represent, does, does anybody, I don't see anybody um, correcting me, which uh, it's kind of scary, but. Um, it, um, that's, that's what I recollect it as well. I agree. Uh, Representative Zahn. Was there a separate issue where she was, because um, uh, maybe I wasn't, I probably wasn't paying as close attention as I should have. There was also a concern she was expressing about relocation uh, being the best approach, uh, the most cost-effective approach for these uh, types of developments. And I thought there was some discomfort with this approach relative to uh, relocation? So, so the commissioner's, the commissioner's um, testimony last week just mentioned that if we put relocation, relocation is a federal funding thing, like if it happens at all, and it's primarily a FEMA based, I mean, I think there are other resources as well, but it's primarily, at least when it's in the aftermath of, a, of, a, of an event, it's a FEMA oriented pot of money. I know that Waterbury had some that, again, was confusing to use, but it was, but relocation itself is not something that happens through the state revolving loans, that the state money does not happen. So while their plan, and, and I think Representative Dolan's discussion about how relocation as a policy is preferred in places rather than mitigating against floods or um, she used the phrase building levees or, um, or berms or I'm not sure what the phrase was, but essentially um, that, you know, there, th this is the, this is the dilemma to me having, again, having experienced this in Waterbury is saying traditional settlement patterns happened like this. And so when they flood, it's really, uh, you, you return it to, what it was FEMA's, FEMA's policy is to at least return it to what it was and that can be expensive because it can happen again and again and so relocation or raising a foundation or taking something out of the flood zone in the long run will prove more efficient or more or less expensive because then that person or that home or that household won't have experienced another flood event if they if they were relocated um, but relocation as a, as a rule is obviously very expensive and usually is, is, is attached to federal funding um, in a time mostly, not only, but mostly in a time of crisis. So and I think it's a preferred policy, but it is also, um, it's, it's also um, the commissioner asked us to not talk about or to not have relocation as part of this because it would give the false hope, I was the commissioner's phrase last week, it would give the false hope to the community that the state would actually um, take care of the relocation as opposed to help them technically in finding the funding for it. Right, and then connected to that though, I think she was just flagging that creating uh, 
that this was potentially going to set a precedent for other communities when it comes to discussions of relocation, when there might be federal dollars available, and then also the restructuring of the state loans and the state funds. I think, I don't know that she was specifically saying to omit this, but I think she was just saying like, we really have to be mindful of the fact that, that what we're gonna end up doing is locking potentially ourselves into this endless loop of mitigation. And, and, and throwing money at the entities over and over and over and over and over and over and and, over. and, and, and uh, uh, she's where I thought this this would help, would help kind, of kind of encourage that perpetual um, throwing money at a problem. Um, I, I yeah, I, I suppose that that was part of it. Um, and again, I hear you know the the, the tension between what we want for statewide policy and what's on the ground in terms of existing, um, in terms of existing um, development is this idea that, um, is this idea that the, I, um, again, it's my home. You can't tell me what to do with my home, but I wanna be more resilient. Or as a community, we wanna be more resilient or as a state, we wanna be more resilient. So each one of those requires a whole different, um, way of doing it but yet that and you're not wrong in hearing in hearing that that was in some of her her comments but this to me um at this point in time and i can obviously be convinced otherwise is fairly narrow to um you know the use of the revolving loan funds or the restructuring of them i don't think is is a precedent I think it's been done. I think we're giving the treasurer more flexibility in some of the language we talked about earlier to deal with um, the to deal with issues like this, where they can set an interest rate that it that works for the community. I think we heard testimony last week from um, from the commissioner about even going into um, negative interest. So um, we have a few questions here, uh, Earhart. Well, if it helps, I would just offer, um, since uh, I appreciate uh, Representative Dolan's uh, concerns, uh, but I would just offer that part of uh, TriPark has already moved a significant number of their lots out of the uh, endangered uh, area uh, post post Irene, and they their master plan involves uh, moving uh, more, relocating additional lots um, out of the floodplain. So uh, you know the language that is here would, would not go towards uh, sort of you know pouring additional money or additional subsidy into uh, an area that's 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 in the in the endangered um, you know flood that that's that's endangered by uh, by the uh, flooding that happens frequently uh, in in that area. So I don't know if that helps, but um, I I, uh, I think Tri Park is very aware of needing to move um, their uh, their lots out of uh, the remaining lots out of uh, out of out of the area. Part, for them, part of the issue, and this is why one of the reasons why the restructuring of the indebtedness needs to happen is that they have you know operating um, operating income um, constraints and and uh, need. Uh, as, as part of their master plan need to have these loans restructured and restructured in such a way uh, that um, hopefully they can actually be forgiven. Um, and just to Commissioner Walk's uh, testimony this morning, uh, while uh, it did give me comfort to hear him say that he uh, thinks forgiveness is included uh, in his understanding of the word uh, restructuring, we, we would still like to see um, the words forgiveness, uh, loan forgiveness, or just simply forgiveness uh, in there to, to make it explicit. And I think you've, you know, the uh, commissioner has the out uh, in the wording uh, to the extent possible. Uh, if it turns out um, due to federal law uh, around these funds that it turns out not to be possible in this instance, then uh, they do have that, um, that, that ability to, to say no, um, because the federal statute, which I did look at, uh, is very complicated, and this is not a uh, funding program that I'm as familiar with as, as others, but it, it did uh, clear, it made clear to me that um, principal forgiveness uh, in some, in, in, in some 
circumstances was uh, was allowable and that is what tri park would be asking for uh, i'll also say that we support the elimination of um the uh, uh the the language around other small uh communities and uh that is that is a helpful uh, uh clarification to to eliminate that and support the commissioner's request on that I, I just wanted to jump in out of turn for a second, uh, Chair, and just say, to clarify, I, I support this provision in the bill. I was just trying to give a fuller picture of the conversation with Representative Dolan. I, I fully support this being in the bill. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Long, then Hango. Thank you. I actually don't have a heck of a lot more to say after hearing what Earhart just said. He basically just said verbatim what I was about to say, being familiar with the master plan and recognizing that um, TriPark has been working very hard to be focused on the relocation of those homes and getting um, the homes out of the floodplain, restructuring those loans or, or, or being able to um, see loan forgiveness will allow them the ability to move forward with the, the re relocation of those homes that they can relocate or even removal eventually of those that they cannot relocate because there are some like, that cannot be relocated even. So I just wanna really support this language in here, even though recognizing Representative Dolan's um, broader concerns, I think this, this language is really important to uh, keep it in here for this um, section 10, which is really quite specific to TriPark. So thanks. And just to recap a little bit, Representative Long, again, the testimony we took was that, I just wanna make clear that, that TriPark represented up to 8% of Brattleboro's, yeah. and Brattleboro is, is 15,000 people. 12, I think. 12, three, three representatives. I, I so yeah. Brattleboro, but 12, I think. Yeah, but it's three, yeah, so it's. Uh, yeah, some So that's a substantial number of people. And I just, again, for people who are less aware about the cooperative um, movement in owning um, mobile home parks, this is a movement that's been going on for a generation or more mm -hmm. uh, in Vermont. It's been very successful in New Hampshire, but in Vermont, it's kicking in a little bit more where the residents are able to, with the state's help, able to try to put together the idea that they own the park rather than the classic um, stereotype that, that there's a uh, you know, that there's a lousy park that has bad, um, and it may have been a quote unquote lousy park with bad facilities at one time, but the, but the park owners, the, the home owners have um, come together to uh, own their living space in a cooperative way, which is, which is pretty forward looking in a lot of ways. And it's not simple. And the fact that they have such a detailed uh, description of what their master plan is, is, is really quite impressive. Um, Ch Ch Chairman Stevens, if I could just say one more thing, um, and that is just to say I, how much I appreciate. I'm, I, first of all, I'm really sorry I was un unable to be there for the first half hour this morning, but I did try to review it in our half an hour break. I didn't get through everything, but I did hear most of what was going on. Um, I just want to say I, how much I appreciate um, Commissioner Walk's response to my question that came up last week, and he has been super supportive and helpful of trying to work through the challenges in the language that language in the bill that we were um, not happy with or didn't that, that wasn't going to be eligible, and um, has actually reached out. I think he mentioned that he reached out to both Senator Ballant and myself. Um, since then and has been working really hard to find language to make this work. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate his efforts on this. He's been working really hard on it. Representative Hango, then Gonzalez. Thank you. I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add, but um, your original question was how we felt about leaving the drinking water um, language in. And my feeling around that, I'll reiterate what I said earlier this morning, that this really isn't our area of expertise. So my hope is if we do leave this language in, as the commissioner has asked us to, that the bill will go to natural resources. They're the experts and they will decide whether it really should remain in there or not. As for loan forgiveness, I'm hesitant to put that into statute to um, make that suggestion that we would be able to do that. 
because we really can't look into the future. I know it says to the extent possible, but I think that covers many scenarios. Um, so thank you. Representative Gonzalez. Um, so I just want to um, say, my, uh, it's not reiterate yeah, okay. the words that I'm stuck on, um, that my support okay. for having re, uh, no, forgiveness um, explicitly I'm in here right. as an option, uh, because yeah. if I that um, okay. is possible, um, then I want to have that be on the table explicitly. Um, so I want to say that. And then the other piece is in terms of, of the, the infrastructure and a representative Dolan um, offered a suggestion around um, uh, flood mitigation for the, the physical buildings themselves. And so I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can tweak the language to um, be a little more explicit about that to uh, try to avoid some of the unintended consequence, potential consequences of a downstream flood increase. Okay, Earhart. Um, thank you. Uh, so really appreciate uh, everyone's uh, comments. And, and just, uh, I wanna put this in a little bit of a context, which is that uh, Tri Park, and I think um, committee members heard their testimony uh, before uh, you all left uh, the state house due to the pandemic. Yep. Um, they have substantial uh, infrastructure and capital needs. This is just we saw as a first installment on helping right. them to address all of the issues that are in their in their master uh, master plan. Um, there was, and I mentioned this yesterday in the original Senate bill, um, there was $750,000 in appropriations uh, that Senate appropriations, as is their usual habit, stripped out when the bill came to them. Uh, and that would have addressed some of the other immediate needs um, within the uh, strictures of not having an appropriation attached to this bill. Um, this was the best that could be done as sort of, I would say, down payment on some of the most uh, you know, pressing needs in terms of them restructuring uh, their debt. They have an overall uh, assessed capital needs of approximately $4 million to address all of their infrastructure issues, including the relocation uh, that both Representative Long and, 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 and I have mentioned. Uh, and of that $4 million, uh, roughly, of overall infrastructure needs, uh, about maybe a million or just over a million could be identified from existing sources. So they, they have a gap that they're going to come back to you uh, with next winter, um, I, I know General Assembly is going to have some of the same revenue and, and uh, budgetary pressures then, but uh, these uh, these are longstanding issues. This is uh, not just, uh, it's, it's unique uh, in so many different ways, uh, both as a per large percentage of the population of Brattleboro as the longest standing housing cooperative in the state, which was formed back in 1989, soon after the General Assembly uh, originally uh, uh, created authorizing legislation for housing cooperatives. And it's also the largest mobile home park in the, uh, in the state. Um, so it, it, it is, um, it, it is eminently in so many different ways deserving of, of the assistance. And this is merely a, a first kind of down payment or first installment uh, towards right. uh, helping with that master plan, given all of your budgetary constraints and the inability to uh, provide actual additional uh, an, an appropriation uh, to them, uh, say through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Thank you. All right. Um, any further questions on this section? Okay, Ellen, can you scroll down a little bit? Where are we at? We're almost done with this section, these sections here. Yep, so section 11 on page 19 is the language um, regarding the, the um, state treasurer. Um, And then uh, section 12 is the implementation section for the incentives under uh, section 2B. So um, allowing the incentives to be available immediately to municipalities that adopt bylaws to comply before the effective date. 
Um, and then the effective date section. So uh, the bill will take effect uh, on December 1st, 2020, except that the new inclusive development provisions of section 2B shall take effect on July 1, 2023. Um, so towns have time uh, to uh, comply before they go into effect. Why did we choose December? Did, uh, did... We, I don't think, uh, so that was in your notes. I don't, I think it's, I don't think there was a necessarily a, a conversation about it, but it was un, in the underlying bill, it was July 1, 2020. So it needs to be changed. Right. Okay, before we get to section two and start a conversation with section two, um, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up was the title of this bill. Um, the title of this bill has gotten a lot of, um, has created a lot of, um, I don't wanna say discord, but it certainly creates the impression that promoting affordable housing, um, especially for all that we've discussed affordable housing this year, it gives the impression that we're talking about the, the quote unquote conventional affordable housing that we work on, which is, which is not what this bill is about. This bill is about building, um, allowing building of, of units that are sustainable and equitable um, and that will achieve you know, some economic development that, we, that the state is pursuing as a policy. But I don't, think that it's about affordable housing alone. And I think um, we have an opportunity to change the name of the bill. And I would um, certainly, if people have thoughts about what it should be, let's think about it over the next you know, hours or so um, and, and change the name of it. And I'd rather, I'd rather have a bill that reflect, I'd rather not have to start talking about a bill that says, well, it's not really about affordable housing. That's not, it's, it's not fair to the bill. It's not fair to the, to the work we're doing. So if we have a more appropriate name that can come forward, please feel free to, um, to share it. Um, so Ellen, let's start the conversation. It's 122. We have until a few minutes before two o'clock today. And, um, Let's discuss what we've heard, what we remember about section two and where we think we need to go. And if Alex, um, I know Alex, are you still here? Yes, yes, oh. I'm still here. Okay, so I know, and again, we'll ask you questions or you can pop your hand up. And again, we'll, we appreciate you being here as a representative of VPA. Um, and for your, you know, and just I'll just remind the committee that, you know, obviously we're taking stakeholders' testimony very seriously, and um, and but that Alex represents. I mean, you could have two hats on. You can have his planner of Heinsberg, or you can have his VPA hat on. I just want to acknowledge that as we move forward, and that's you know the same with anybody who's here as guests. Um, you know, representative um, uh, Chris Cochran is here from DHCD. Um, and I'm saying, who else do we have? Kate here. Kate McCarthy is here from VNRC. She testified on this bill in support of some of the VPA changes um, last week, or the week I guess it was last week. So, and Earhart's here as um, as a member of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. This is clearly the uh, the most difficult section and the most complex section of the bill. So, um, Ellen, if we could just start by um, doing the same walkthrough that we've been doing, that would be great. Sure, so I'm on page two of the strike all document. Um, we're in Title 24, Section 4412. So this is the required provisions and prohibited provisions in terms of bylaws for municipalities. So um, in the strike all, the first- um, Time out. This is the section we we're talking about with the attorney general language, correct? Yes. 
Right. Okay. Yes. And Coming so back, yeah, to tie it together here. This is the section we're talking, the, the, this is the general section with changes now in it. Yes, and so I guess technically the first change is that right here on line 13, um, we add a subdivision A um, and because so, currently uh, that, that doesn't exist. And so the attorney general section refers to 44121, which starts here with the it's, uh, related to equal treatment of housing and affordable housing. Um, and so one of the first sections we're gonna talk about is the ADU provision. And that provision is protected by the enforcement provision in the attorney general language. Okay, thank you. And just to, before we really get second gear here, I just want to be clear that this is um, the equal treatment of housing and required provisions for affordable housing. I mean, that, that also ties into our Fair Housing Act, ties into our protected classes, which include people who are, are low income um, already. I mean, there's already fair housing anti-discrimination language that exists elsewhere. Um, well, it's in the fair. It's in the Fair Housing Act. Is that, and that's not mentioned here, but that's what municipalities still have to follow when they're developing bylaws, and that's where we're putting the enforceability in. Is that? Am I getting that right? Um, yes, and I think one um, A. That is where these ellipses. Uh, that would be where the ellipses are. I think 1A does refer to the Fair Housing Act. Um, so I think that reference is in one of there, but there is a number of provisions. It's um, A through F that are the um, equal housing, equal treatment of housing provisions. And so the list that I read earlier are uh, the, you know, the can't exclude things. That's what these ellipses are, I, I cut all of them out. Um, yeah. So those ellipses are there. And I think that's this section is actually one reason why affordable housing may have been a title or, or led to be a title because it's affecting, it can affect people with low income um, and, and it is housing that's trying to be infill or, or multi-unit, which is traditionally, but not solely um, thought of in a, in a affordable way. So section E is the change so this is the um, the ADU language, the accessory dwelling unit language. Um, the language in the strike all is the same as it came over from the Senate. And so we're um, uh, amending the definition of accessory dwelling unit. And so this section starts out by saying, municipalities, the, the bylaw cannot exclude as permitted one accessory dwelling unit and so that accessory dwelling unit is located within or pertinent to a single family dwelling on an owner occupied lot. So that's the first change. So we're, we're saying that they has to be an owner occupied lot as opposed to owner occupied dwelling. And then um, we, so this, this next sex, uh, sentence is just a uh, restructuring from down below. Um, but the next change is that an accessory dwelling unit, uh, we struck the language regarding uh, requiring it to be an efficiency or a one bedroom. So um, it can be larger than that, but it has to be a distinct unit, clearly subordinate to a single family dwelling. And then the, we also included that it can be, um, the unit can be 30% of the total floor area or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. And then we strike the... Um... So, so this is allowing, so again, I'll use, um, if I have an attached garage and I want a mother-in-law apartment, I can have that. And that's considered an accessory dwelling unit and it can only be a certain amount of size. And because it's attached to a garage, it's clearly subordinate to um, the single family home. What this is doing is um, saying that the um, I can have a tiny house in my backyard, provided I have wastewater capacity and I actually have the land to do it and the room to do it. But this allows me to create a small unit that sort of stands alone 
in my backyard. Um, so it doesn't have to be attached um, and I don't have to be living in it. I can just, it can just be on my so-called property. Yes. Okay, Representative Gonzalez. And as I understand it, that really the, um, the change here besides some reordering of words is that instead of it, the um, size being capped at 30% of the main dwelling unit, it could be 30% or 900 feet or 900 square feet. And, um, and, and then it, it could, so in that, if it was 900 square feet, um, that's um, potentially big enough to have more than one bedroom. So that's also why it's striking out efficiency or, or one bedroom apartment. That's, that's how I read it. Is that your understanding as well, of the, like the substantial change of it? Yes. Great, thank you. And, and this says, if I just wanna put one in, that zoning will allow this. But if I wanna put in two, zoning could say, no, you can't put in two or a duplex or something like that. It has to be this small and still remain part of, essentially trying to remain part of what, it has to be subordinate to the house. Yes, so it does, so towns have to allow one. Um, they can prohibit more than one accessory dwelling unit. However, this language does also allow towns to be more flexible. So they could uh, adopt bylaws that allow multiple um, dwelling uh, accessory dwelling units if they preferred. And that goes back to the charter question, right? So a town like a city like Burlington has its own set of rules that operate outside or adjacent to the state's laws. This is addressing all those municipalities that don't have their charters. And, and I mean, the ones that have charters as well, but it allows them to do that. But this is really a benefit to the towns that don't have a charter and can make up, can make up their own rules. Is that, is that what we're doing here? This isn't strictly limited to towns that already have their own charters, municipalities that have their own charters. I, I really don't know the interactions between charters and bylaws, so I, I don't, I can't answer that. Um, but this is, this language is, applies to all municipalities, right. um, so. All right, so Alex, do you have a quick clarification? Just to let you know that this language isn't benefiting municipalities. This language is benefiting um, landowners and, and residents because the existing language allows municipalities to be less restrictive than what is in the current accessory dwelling unit provisions, municipalities have already have the ability to do lots of innovative things with accessory dwelling units. This language just, may, I guess, provides state policy on where the, the minimum should be set um, and, and provide some clarity. Uh, but it's really a benefit to homeowners who would like to do these things and might live in a community that hasn't um, flexed the accessory dwelling units as much as this these provisions anticipate. Okay, Representative Kalaki, then Son. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just I, I always thought of accessory dwelling units being attached, so it's interesting as your clarification, but. Could this mean someone could park a trailer on their front yard? Because if it doesn't have to so, be. Um, so we're talking about a distinct unit. So um, right. a dwelling unit and it has to have, uh, it has to have, um, Facilities and provisions for independent living, including sleeping, food preparation, and sanitation. So, um, well, my, my physical therapist told me she's living in a trailer in her mother's um, driveway. And I thought, oh, okay. And so, is, is would that qualify under this? Would her mother be allowed to do this? Could no one say you can't have that trailer there? Um, I guess I'm wondering if uh, what the sanitation, so, so I'm, so is, would that qualify as an accessory dwelling unit? 
and then the town would have to allow it. Um, I'm not sure, could, does it have um, sanitation facilities? Well, most trailers do have some kind, of, but they may not be attached to any wastewater system. So maybe that's the difference. Yeah, Alex had his hand up for a split second there. Okay, thanks, Alex. Yeah, we deal with this at the local level all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that a, a landowner could make the case that a trailer would, could qualify as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, I don't think there's any language in here that would prohibit a trailer from being considered. Um, however, a lot of municipalities deal with uh, trailers, especially recreational vehicles, differently than um, than dwelling units, and they okay. and we make it we make a distinct we distinguish between the two of them in definitions and the like, and municipalities have the authority to do that, and so any municipality that feels it necessary um, can do so, and certainly this this accessory dwelling unit provision has been in statute for a very long time, so this what's proposed wouldn't change anything along the lines of what you're uh, the scenario you're talking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Representative Zott, then Earhart. And just a clarification on um, the the use of the accessory dwelling unit. Uh, when we package this law with the ability to regulate short-term rentals, municipalities can say, "Oh yeah, these are the." These are sufficient for accessory dwelling units in our communities, but if you're going to be using for short-term rentals, that's not allowed. Does it? Does this language force municipality municipalities to allow short-term rentals as accessory dwelling as a, as allowable ADUs? Uh, because I'm I very much want to do everything we can to hamstring the further production of short-term rentals in the state. And so if this does anything to help those things proliferate, I want to make sure that we have language that hems it in in some way, uh, because I think it just is, they've had incredible, at least impact in my district, and really creating a short supply of rental housing. So this language says that a town must allow one accessory dwelling unit um, when attached or pertinent to a single family dwelling unit and it sets the size requirements from that. Um, the bill then later separately says a town may regulate short term rentals separately and just in a different way from the way they regulate um, long term rental housing. So I don't think it is in any way um, for forcing them to allow short-term rentals, um, they are given the ability to regulate separately um, and, and establish separate rules for short-term rentals versus long-term rentals. Right, so that's sort of my understanding, but I'm, I'm worried that there is a kind of de facto encouragement here. I can see a lot. I mean, and then I can also understand the argument for it. Like I can see a retiring a uh, couple that wants to move into a smaller space and rent out, you know, the other home and short-term rentals and have that supplemental income. I hear that argument in my district that, you know, there's um, sort of um, uh, restricted income individuals who do quite well with this. But um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that we can do anything specific, but I'm really a little sketched out about this provision. I, I want to see ADUs proliferate, but I want to see them used to house long-term folks, not short-term vacationers. Okay, and again, the the offering of the tool to allow local zoning on ADUs is, is something that's new in here as well. Um, Earhart and then Representative Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, to the original question about the interplay between this and um, municipal charters, I can tell you from personal experience, having represented the city of Burlington, which perhaps has the most expansive charter in the state, back when the ADU provision was first uh, brought into Chapter 117, I think it was probably around 2004, 2005, um, it very much applied to Burlington. And uh, by extension, I would say that um, it, it, it 
applies uh, to ta all towns that uh, that have uh, charters. It, it basically establishes a uh, a floor um, beyond uh, below which uh, municipalities cannot restrict um, um, a a to use and and certainly can be more per permissive as as both uh, Alex and um, Alan have have testified uh, to the question about short term rentals. I do know that um, in its um, in Burlington's own uh, discussions around uh, ADUs and making uh, uh, them more uh, easy to develop in Burlington, there was the question about um, would that uh, would that encourage uh, conversion of some of those to uh, short-term rentals? And I, I, I would say that there really are two separate issues uh, that need to be addressed uh, uh, addressed separately. And, and by providing the uh, authorization to municipalities to regulate short-term rentals, I, I think you're helping uh, address the concern that uh, Representative Zott has, um, has, has raised. Representative Gonzalez. And I think that with the, the increase to 900 square feet as the minimum, it actually re, um, reduces the possibility that ADUs would be short-term rentals because it's more habitable. Um, so um, that uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact average of Vermont homes in terms of square feet, but um, it's not that big. And so the 30% um, the um, on average for homes would be um, a, a small dwelling unit, um, but would, that would be more uh, attractive as a short-term rental rather than a 900 square feet, which is um, not, not grand, but very livable. Um, and so uh, I think that, that this change actually reduces the possibility of the short-term rentals. And I will, um, you know, direct people's attention to the to the article I sent. I think it was yesterday. To talk about because um, this represents uh, an attempt to try, along with the zoning stuff that follows. This is this is um, trying to work towards a policy that supports what is been called in this article and, and in others middle housing. Right where and 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 the article com was compelling not just in what we've been talking about but in an avenue that I hadn't really thought about, which was um, if I you know become seventy five years old and I don't want to live in a three thousand square foot home or a six bedroom house in a you know in a in a suburb of Burlington or whatever you know that that in in Vermont's population is stagnant that people are going to have a harder time perhaps selling their homes. Um, or they just want to live closer to home, whether it's in assisted living or, you know, if they don't want to live in assisted, so-called assisted living, they want to live in a, in a more settled area. So this is, it was, it was just an interesting article. If you haven't read it yet, please, please look it up and, um, and, and just have an explanation cl more closely um, in context with what middle housing is. And I think that's what this is striving for in, in our, in our work here. All right. Um, Seeing no further hands up at this time, um, uh, let's scroll down to the rest of those. Oh, Representative Kalak, you got his hand up there. You can keep scrolling up to the next section. <laughs> Thank you. I, I had a proposed title, but I'll wait till the, I thought you were winding up to tell us to go to the floor. So No, I wanna finish this one little section yeah. just to get through that. Um, now I'll tell you my title later. Actually, let's make this the stopping point because again, this this language here at the top of this page, again, allows for the regulation of um, the residential units. And so let's just let's just bookmark that there and stop right there and we'll pick that up. Um, you guys can pick that up in conversation tomorrow, um, the committee discussion tomorrow. And um, because there's nothing better than talking about this bill at 8.30 in the morning on a Friday. Um, so with that, uh, John, what's your, what's, your, what's your proposed title? An act expanding equitable and sustainable housing in Vermont. Those yeah, were yeah. the words yeah. you used earlier and I just wrote them down. I thought, oh, that's pretty nice. It seems to capture the, uh, what I'm sensing the through line is here. Okay, Ellen, just keep that in your 
on a post-it and um, again folks we can we can continue this conversation I um, will not be here tomorrow um, I have to go and uh, inter my mother's ashes she's been dead for two and a half years and the family is finally getting around to it it's it's not a cabaret story um, but um, Ellen, could you could you unshare your screen so I can see everybody? There we go. Um, so I'm going to check in with Chip Triano, um, who will lead the meeting tomorrow, and and Deanna, if you're there to help with uh, any of the technical stuff. Um, Mike, um, if you could make an invitation available to everybody who's here at, who can who can make it. Alex, Kate, Chris, um, Earhart, any and. Um, to continue conversation and just is available. Um, and committee, I would my expectation would be that you can um, really continue these conversations scrolling through section two and two B. Um, and then we will pick up the further conversation on Tuesday. It's we need to make some decisions on this bill pretty soon um, and but I think it's our responsibility to just sort of hammer out what we've heard and see if we can put it into a format that we agree on and then go from there um, and have a final discussion over pieces of the bill you know early next week so um, I will um, considering we only had a half an hour break during lunch well let's just be done for now and we have, uh, I don't know if, how long it'll be, but it's budget day on the floor. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your time, um, Alex and Kate. Thanks for listening in. And um, Chris, thank you for offering. And, and Earhart, thank you for offering your, your feedback um, as well to help clarify some of this for us. Um, that's it.